All right, now, Vander, hold up your hand. We would normally touch hands, but now we're going to go back in time. It's time to go back in the time machine. Whoa! Whoa! Here we are, Vander. Oh, no! Oh, let's still go. All right, all right. Double, a double time machine. All right. I'm just saying how far back we're going. Oh, no, sweetie. Oh, there's dinosaurs. Wait a minute, we've gone too far. We've gone too far. Oh, God. Oh, we're here in Imperial. Imperial City, California. Oh, and there's little Vander. Oh, oh and she's God. styling a baby wig. <laughs> we got a picture of you <laughs> in, in a bigger. baby wig. Let's take a look at that. Oh, my oh God. My God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Who knew that that you... cute little baby with a bunny would turn into the spookiest queen in town? <laughs> you dug deep. Oh, my God. You could not tell me I wasn't the fiercest bitch at the daycare in that wig. Like... <laughs> now, what were you like as a kid? Um, I was actually really quiet and really kept to myself. I was an only child, and uh, most of my cousins were older than me, so I kind of just learned to entertain myself. And I lived in a really small town with very little, very little of anything to inspire me. So I like, I really clung on to movies. Um, every Friday, my dad would take me to the video rental store, and he would get me five movies every Friday, so I could watch throughout the week. And that was what kept me. Alive, I feel in my hometown. It's what kept me from being just like completely miserable where I was living. What are some of the movies that really stand out that were, you know, game changers for you? Ooh, a lot of a lot of movies with witches. I mean, The Wizard of Oz, um, The Witches with Angelica Houston, mm. uh, The Craft. I loved The Others with Nicole Kidman when I was a kid. Um, I loved uh, some of the like '80s horror films like Fright Night or Night of the Demons. So I really, I really clung on to horror. That's what really, since I, for as long as I can remember, I, I clung on to it to, I guess, sort of vent what I was feeling in my hometown. Now you uh, also sort of were between two cultures growing up, right? Because yeah. you were you were back in Imperial City, but then you would go to Mexico to be with your grandparents, right? Yeah, I lived in Calexico, and Mexicali is across the border. They're right next to each other, so I was just back and forth um, my whole life. And what was that duality like for you? Um, you know, it's very interest. It's a very interesting duality. It's one of those things where um, because you grow up on both sides. Like when I go to Mexico. It's like, oh, you're an American, but when I'm in in the U.S., it's like, oh, you're Mexican. It's like it's it's, it's weird, like you're not one or the other. Um, I I actually really loved it. I'm really grateful for it. Uh, I it had a difficult upbringing because it, it is very like you know Catholic conservative uh, town, but I it's one of those things where like I don't wish that kind of upbringing on anyone else, but because I experienced it and because I dealt with what I dealt with, I came out much stronger on the other side. So in, in a sense, I'm kind of grateful for it, but maybe not the best way to go about getting you know, a, a strong, thick skin. <laughs> right, certainly a difficult way to go yeah, about it. Uh -huh. But you know, I, 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 I guess I'm grateful for what it was, yeah. Now were you like a, in school, were, were you a weird kid? Were you a goth kid? <sighs> Oh yeah, God, I can was... only imagine, Vander, that oh. you were there with an emo haircut, all black. Oh, God. Am I, I right? So gay. <laughs> like, I was like excruciatingly gay. <laughs> and when did when did the gay part come into your mind? Is like I'm gay. Ooh, I think I was 12 or 13, and it was a time where I was battling with my faith because I, I had been raised Catholic. Right, and that and... is not easy Ooh, to no, yeah. mm -hmm. to balance those two out because. Yeah. The Catholic Church has not only been doing some terrible things over the years, but they've been very harsh on homosexuality and yeah. made it very difficult for mm -hmm. people in their faith to come out. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't really, not just as a gay person, but like as a, like as a trans person, I couldn't really discover, I didn't discover my trans identity until I moved out of my hometown because in my hometown I wasn't safe to explore that side of myself or many sides of myself. I think moving out was when I really flourished. And so when, when did you leave? I left when I was 20. I uh -huh. moved to L.A. to pursue film. And then this happened. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How long between you moving to L.A. and getting on Dragula? It was maybe about a year and a half to two years. I had only been doing drag for about a year and a half because I started drag almost right after I, I moved to L.A. Mm -hmm. And what about now you came, you, you came out to yourself before you came out publicly. Yeah. And... Then, when when was your your journey into understanding that you were trans? Um, you know, dr drag really helped me to discover my my trans identity. I 
had always been very effeminate and felt that within me and always wanted to wear certain things or, or you know, present a certain way and I, I just couldn't in my hometown. And even when I moved to LA, I was still very uncomfortable doing it. Uh, and drag kind of was a segue as like an like an acceptable way of, of you know gender bending you know because oh it's like it's it's like acting it's for stage you know so it's fine uh, and funny enough I was I think one of the really pivotal moments for me was during the first Dragula UK tour um, I, I had decided not to pad before the show for the meet and greet so I wouldn't get all sweaty because there's like hardly any air conditioning in the UK right. so I was doing the meet and greets without any pads and I was wearing this skirt that was like a wrap around like satin drape like really beautiful slinky skirt and it had a, a slit down the side and I had just finished getting ready I got in the van and we were I was waiting for the other girls to get in the van so we could go to the venue and the slit like opened up and it had like my bare leg which I, I had hardly ever seen my bare legs in drag because I was always padded but it was like my bare leg with just a fishnet and a stiletto. And I felt hot. Yeah. I felt hot as shit. And I never, I like threw the pads out and I never padded after that. So there were like just those moments that, those, those really key moments that I remember that were like, oh, like that's when I started to like get it. Um, and, and then, you know, I, it starts to become a thing where it's like, oh, but I don't want to take the drag off. I just want to be in it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And how about your parents? I mean, at being Catholic, I mean, see, you told me they're amazing now, but yeah. what was that? They accepted accept you as gay, and then what was your communication with them when you decided you wanted to let them know you were trans? Um, by the time I let them know, I, I like brought up to them the topic about being trans. They were already very, very versed in um, like queer the queer community. So like they had gone to nightgowns, so they got to see Sasha Colby. They got to, uh, you know a, a trans drag queen. Yeah, they incredible. got to see a uh, land insider, like a drag king. So they they had references for people that they knew in person who could be all these things and still be very successful. So they they weren't really phased by it. They were just like, oh okay. <laughs> right. Know? Well, that's good. That's yeah, how it should yeah. be. <laughs> mm -hmm. it was, uh, yeah, they're amazing. Now let's take it back just a little bit. Once you got to LA, what was your original dream? Um, my original dream, which I guess it still stands, it still very much is my dream. I wanted to pursue film and I wanted to pursue film as a, as a director. And I work regularly in film as a production designer, an art director, things like that. Uh, I don't get to direct as, as often, uh, but that's where I'd like to keep moving towards. What was your first drag performance ever? I think, oh, I remember. I did Marina and the Diamonds, Bubblegum Bitch with bits of, oh my God, I, this is so different from how I perform now, but it had like sound bites from Tiffany from Bride of Chucky, and I was like in a wedding dress. It was just, <laughs> it was like quintessential, like spooky drag number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you also, when you got to LA, you sort of got into the BDSM scene, and that must have oh. influenced your drag oh as well. you like really did your ah, research. Yeah. Yes. You're on a queen, oh we don't God. mess around. Bitch, you better. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I kind of uh, started delving into the like kink and BDSM scene as well. Again, it's just like I, I wanted to do all these things for so long and I moved to LA and it's just like the world is at your fingertips. Yeah. Make sure that you are following us on all social media on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc., 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 at Hey Queen TV. Right, Lady Red? That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, Vander, now it's time to get into it. Get into it. Get into it. We want to hear all about that first go round on Dragula, honey. Okay. Yeah, okay. Let's, get let's get in. Into it. Ooh, what a rough patch. Let's do uh, this. Honey. <laughs> I mean, because for someone who seems like quite a sensitive soul, you were thrown into the, with the wolves on that season. Yeah. That was a lot of big personalities. Uh huh. We had uh, the Pinche, Meatball, Frankie, Doom, Ursula Major, Foxy Ajwe, Zoshi Mochi, Melissa B. Fierce. Those are no shrinking violets. No, I like shit my panties the first day on set when I saw everyone. <laughs> right. That must have been something. Now, how did you get here about Dragula, and what was the process for getting so, on? Season one, because the show didn't exist, right. and the Boulets kind of wanted to go under the radar because it was, you know, the very first season and everything. They actually reached out to a lot of people in LA about auditioning, so. Um, I, they personally reached out to me, and, and I, I auditioned based on that, yeah. Yeah, I remember the day that they came to the Hey Queen studio and told me about the idea of the show and what they were going to do, and I was like, sounds oh my God. incredible. <laughs> and it was. It, oh, was, it was quite an something. It was experience. I'll never forget it. Now, what were your first impressions on that day? You said you were <laughs> pants. I was <laughs> my panties. I mean, I, again, like, 
I hadn't worked with most of these bitches because these are people that only work when they're getting paid. I wasn't getting paid. I was doing exposure. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I specifically remember when the bag came off of Melissa's head. I was like, all right, we can all go home. Right, because she <laughs> is fierce. Home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a lot of, I think I, I think I was trying to be very just like stoic and like I was unfazed and I, I think it kind of came across that way on the show, but I was I was really f***ing scared. You was, you was <laughs> phased. <laughs> Uh, now, how did you prepare? Because your looks were so incredible. Thank you. How much time did you have to prepare? And like, what was your preparation? I mean, they would give us about two to three days between issuing the challenge to filming the episode. So it was like two or three days of just no sleeping, just making, 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 making. And I, I made about, I made everything I wore except the gown I was crowned in. Um, right. So I just, I would show up to set on like no sleep, exhausted out of my mind, like hawk loose strings trailing behind me. Because <laughs> <laughs> that process is different than Drag Race, where Drag Race they yeah. get like the list and then they have a few weeks and then they got to go and bring everything. Yeah, now, now unfortunately now we've had to do that with, with right. the coming seasons. Because it's international because, now. Because it's international now and season two, if contestants went out and tried to get materials, they would get clocked. It's like, what is Victoria Black from Florida doing in Santee Alley? Mm, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. But for this one, because nobody knew what it was and yeah. everyone was in LA, you were able to have a little more time so you could just get into your your, yeah. your mm -hmm. costume mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the, the day of the issuing, I would rush downtown, get my materials, go home, and just... Well, let's go through some of these looks because they are stunning. Okay. Uh, let's look at the episode one witch look. Oh. I mean... Uh, Look at her, oh wow. That's actually, I think, my favorite challenge, and it was the first one. That was my favorite challenge. Now, what's the inspiration behind this incredible one? I was always very inspired by, like, Betty Davis as Queen Elizabeth when she shaved her hairline back for the film. Yes. And I saw it as a kid, and I was like, that bitch looks so scary. Like, I want to be that bitch. <laughs> so that's where I kind of took, like, a lot of my looks, I do the really far back forehead. Part of it is divine, and part of it is Betty Davis as Queen Elizabeth. And I've always been very inspired by uh, period fashions, like Victorian fashions and things like that, Elizabethan fashion. So like the bodice is very Elizabethan, but the skirt was kind of like a weird like mushroom skirt. And, uh, and the shaved back hairline was also like kind of Elizabethan nod. So now, like, when you show up in that, and some of the other girls are putting their stuff together with duct tape and paper clips, what was their reaction? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I did too. You just don't see them on the uh. outfit. They're, they're, hidden, they're concealed within. Right. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at this episode three look, which is the Death Valley episode. Oh, yay. Oh, God, that was... Uh, nice. There you are. I mean, genius. Vander, genius. That was the hardest f***ing episode. That's the hardest film shoot I've done in my life. That was like, I mean, in full drags in Death Valley, it, like, I don't wish that anyone. And we were shooting for maybe like 10 plus hours just... Roasting and drag. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Now, take me back to that day. Like, what's a typical day on that original Dragula set? They were actually very short. <laughs> I hope the belays don't read me for this. They were actually very short because we had very few, re like we had very few cameras. We didn't really have sound equipment. So like there wasn't much to set up. We didn't have many lights. So it was kind of like, Action, you know? <laughs> so it was actually really quick. There, I remember the first day, like the witch episode, I think we shot in like under seven hours, which is why for a shoot day is like extremely short. Uh, but now they reached like the like 12 to 15 hour mark. Yeah, well, I yeah. mean, now the, the expectation is higher and higher. Yeah. Everyone was already, everyone during the first season were like, well, I wish they'd get a budget, blah, blah, blah. Like, well, now they have one and now you can see it's over the top. Oh, trust, those bitches still complain. <laughs> Of course. Or complain. <laughs> now you were never in the bottom uh, on the whole season. No, I was. I was up for extermination, but I was never. I was never in the bottom. Well, you volunteered yourself for ex self for extermination mm -hmm. in episode three, yeah. and you ate the brains with yeah. Loris and Meatball yeah. and Foxy. <laughs> now, <laughs> tell me, take me back to that moment. When did you figure out that it was brains at the end, and what was going through your mind, and what were you feeling and reacting you to? Know, I had a feeling because the theme was zombie, right? We're loading the van to go to Death Valley, and there's a very suspicious cooler that we've been instructed not to open. Oh boy. So it's like, okay, there's some kind of animal something in there, zombie challenge, we're gonna have to eat something. So I kind of went into it already expecting that. 
Uh, and then actually doing it, it's funny, everyone asks me, like, what did they taste like? I mean, they didn't taste great. They tasted pretty bad, but they didn't taste like awful. The texture was the hardest. It was impossible to swallow. It was like, like a hard boiled egg yolk. You know how it's like, almost like powdery? Uh -huh. It was like that, like I would swallow and it would just ever so slowly <laughs> go down my esophagus. <laughs> so like the, the physical act of eating it was actually much harder than tasting it. Oh my God. Ooh. Now Lady Red, you once said that you wouldn't do Drag Race, but you were gonna go on Dragula with a disguise. Yes. I would love, <laughs> I would f***ing love to see Lady Red on Dragula. Right? The only problem is everybody would know who I am because I couldn't get no smaller, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd be Lady like, Red. Rah! And they're like, oh, we know who it is, Lady Red! <laughs> <laughs> Lady Red, would you rename yourself for Dragula? Yes! What would you call yourself? Monstracitus. Monstrositus. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, I like her. Are we ever going to see Monstrositus uh, incarnate? Uh, I don't know, you know, let, I'm getting a little older, so we, you know. It might be on my schedule. All right. Oh, all right. I, mean, <laughs> I was like, we're getting older? Okay, I guess that means you've got to cross it off the bucket yeah. list. <laughs> you've got to cross. Oh Monstrositus might be coming your way next season, oh Vander. <laughs>